Lynn Hallema is going to read the scriptures for us this morning, and I invite you to stand as we hear the gospel of Christ. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From this fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Be seated. I love mysteries. I love mysteries. Right now, I'm on my e-reader. Well, not right now, but I'm on my e-reader reading uh, from a guy named Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Do you know him? Sherlock Holmes. And I love Sherlock Holmes because the stories just make so utter great sense. Once it's all explained, you... Of course, we don't see the things that he sees in his mind, but we see the things that, that he uh, brings out, and it's just, just a wonderful, wonderful way to read mystery. I always want to know, because I'm one of these people who sometimes skip through books just the way I skipped through the book here this morning, and I want to know who done it. I want to know how it ends. And it's patience and careful reading that allows you to pick up what the author is trying to tell you in the story. Mystery. You want to talk about mystery? You talk about John 1, 14 through 18. Well, actually, verse 14. And the word became flesh and made his tent among us. And we beheld his glory the glory of the one and only Son of the Father. This is Brahms' translation. It's a picture of God becoming human. The Creator taking on human form. You know, I don't know how many of you go into Google, but all you have to do is go into Google and say, uh, what did Jesus look like? And when you do that, you find yourselves in, a, in a, a muddy mire in which everybody has an opinion about what Jesus looks like. Pictures of him make him handsome with, with this beautiful uh, long hair that is always wavy and not only nice, but it's also always clean. He's got this nice brown hair, or maybe, maybe you're from the idea that, no, Jesus was more European than he was Jewish, so he probably had blonde hair and blue eyes, nice, beautiful beard, light skin, looking just like we do. No matter what you say, it's the Bible that gives us a picture of Jesus an accurate picture. He's a Jew. Jesus looked like a typical Jew. Jesus had that nose and those dark eyes and probably a grin to go with it if you've ever watched a Jewish person grin. And if he were to go join us this morning and we were all of the same clan, that Jewish clan, you know what we would say? Nothing special about this guy. The girls might not even give him a second look. In fact, Isaiah 53 says that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him 
Nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. In other words, Jesus just looked like an ordinary Joe Blow. Like you and me. But there was something special about him. The specialty comes through the fact that Jesus was ordained by God to come. That somehow he who spoke the world into, into being would take on a form of the one that he had made. Most people here this morning know the Christmas story. We know the story about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men and King Herod and him going off to Egypt and coming back to live in Nazareth. We know about John the Baptist and Elizabeth and, and Zechariah. We know all the stories that go along. But I would dare say that majority of the people that you know who do, do not go to church probably don't remember the Christmas story. Ravi Zechariah tonight in his video that we're going to watch uh, tells the story of, of the Good Samaritan. And we might laugh at the story. If you come, you will laugh. I know you will laugh because you understand the story. But Ravi says that the sad thing is that the majority of our neighbors won't know the story and won't see the humor. And see, that's the problem with Jesus becoming flesh. People scoffing that God would become man. It sounds too much like a Greek myth. That God would become human flesh, like the creature. People think it laughable that a young maiden who has never had sex before would conceive and bear a son. Never mind that he would bear a son, but the savior of the world? And even within the church, the modern church, the whole idea of the virgin birth is frowned upon, it is denied, it is simply skipped over. It's a matter of non-importance. But when you read Matthew, and the Bible is true, and it's one of those pages you don't skip over, then you understand that the story is quite true. Here's how I think about it. If you still have your Bibles open, read with me, John 1, 12, and 13. Okay? It's the story of just before where we began this morning. Listen to these words. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. When I think about what God did in the incarnation of Jesus, I think, bingo, that's exactly what God did. It's how we're born into the kingdom of God, says Paul, and writes John, but it's not by human will. We come there by faith, by grace alone. We come not of human will. It is not my will to become a Christian. It is God's will within me. It is not flesh and blood. It is not human ingenuity that somehow makes me a person within the kingdom of God, that makes me a child of God. It is not by the will of man where I will myself into the kingdom of God and God has no choice but to take me. I met some of those folks this week. In the same way, Jesus was not born because we wanted him. Jesus wasn't born because someone was praying for a redeemer, although God had promised, and God does keep his promises. He was born like you and I are born into the kingdom of God by the will of God. The Old Testament testifies to his coming. And John makes sure that we understand that even as we are born into the kingdom of God from flesh into spirit, now the spirit God comes and becomes flesh. In fact, he says his very next word, 
and the Word became flesh. God did something for us and within us that is true, that makes us children of God, that allows us to wear this badge, hello, my name is a child of God, that allows us to walk with the Father, to have uh, life with Jesus, to have understanding from the Spirit. You and I are bonded in the, in, in the gift of God. And God only did it because he became flesh. He became like us. He became us. The second thing of that passage, and you know, we could spend a lot more time on this passage, these four, five verses that we read. What we're doing this morning is not paying near enough attention to anything and everything that's there. But he tented among us. He dwelt among us, we're told. The word of God came and he pitched his tent. That's the literal meaning of the word. A few years ago, back in the 1960s, my older brother, Andy, took my younger brother and I, along with their family, to Algonquin. We tented. The ground was hard, uneven, but as a kid, who cared? I was probably 13 or 14. My nieces just loved having us around, and, and we played with them. We ran through the woods with them, and as we um, came a little bit closer to the time that my brother had set aside time for him and, and the two of us to, uh, to uh, canoe the Lake of Two, two Rivers and and then go through a small canal and go to the next lake and then through another small canal and go through the next lake where we tented again on a small island. And on the next day, we came back against rough weathers. We, we made it across the Lake of Two Rivers, but we had to call somebody to come and pick us up because that lake was way too rough. I've got pictures of that in my head, of the tall trees, of the tents all around us. Oh, no, yes. My brother called them Americans. The big rigs with television, refrigerators, heat to keep them warm. Nothing rugged about them. By the way, that's the way I like to go camping these days, too. They were the non campers. You wouldn't have found Jesus in one of them. He would have been in a tent. That's exactly the picture. He would have been in a tent close to where the people were. Those who weren't interested in what was going on in the States or around them who were there for vacation. Everybody looked and acted just like we did. Tried to keep dry in the rain. Tried to keep warm at night. John says the very word of God did exactly that with us. He came and he tented with us. His body became the tent in which he lived, not just for two or three years. He, he just didn't come a flash, um, but he was there for 31 years, 33 years. He came and he dwelt with us. The word tabernacle, this is another word we can use. And if you think about the tabernacle in, in the Old Testament, which became the center of God's people's, lives because it was in the center of the of the camp in which they were camping that's where he was in the center of their lives i wrote this down he i i wrote he who spoke creation into being walked the same dusty roads roads as his friends he ate and drank the same food as his parents worked with the same tools as his father joseph sat on the same hills with 5000 plus sailed the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, worshipped in the same synagogues as the common folks, and came to the ten, uh, temple with the, just the same way as the teachers and the scribes of the law. He was us. He was us. Except for sin, Paul says. He is like us. So what difference does that make? 
It makes every difference in the world. It means we could look at him, we could touch him, we, we could understand him. We knew what he was saying, what he was doing. We didn't know how he did raising the lepers, the dead, making the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak. We don't know how he did it. I don't know how he walked on the water. I don't know how he took a little bit of food and made it grow. If I think about last night, I think about those, what, six pans of food that you created, made for us, right? If in Jesus' hands, that would have fed the world. Everybody. I don't know how he did it, but it made a difference. In him, we became to understand who God is and his great, deep, sensitive love for us, his compassion, his grace, his power, his goodness. That's what it was for. And he has this desire for, for himself to be the center of attention in our lives. The center of attention on Monday mornings when we have to grump, when we get grumpy and we have because we have to go back to work or to school. Or the center of our attention when we lay in a hospital bed or in an ER. He wants to become the center of attention so that, as someone told me this past week, that his, when it comes to dying, that's not an issue. He wants to meet his Lord. that center of attention. He wants to dwell among us, yes, but he wants to dwell in us. He wants to live here. Now, we say in our heart, but may I, <clears throat> may I please tell you that the heart is not enough. He wants you all, every part of you, your brain, your mind. He wants your eyes, your ears, your nose. Uh, he wants your liver, your kidneys. He wants you all. That's where he wants to live. So the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He showed us how to live for God. And we beheld his glory. His glory. The glory of the one and only of the Father. John, the gospel writer, calls Jesus the word, the light, the life. I mean, we've seen all those already. And now he calls him glory. In other words, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Oh, yes, John says that somewhere. In other words, Jesus is not just a son that God sends. He sends his very spitting image. He sends himself in the form of Christ, as it were. John makes no bones about who this God, Jesus is, where he came from. John says right off the bat, right in the beginning, here is God standing in front of you, and you can't miss it. In verse 18, no one has ever seen God except the Son who is close to the Father's heart. He has made him known. It is God, the only Son, that has made him known to us. And that was the task of the Son, was it not? To make the Father known, so that we might know who God is, that we might be revealed God's glory. Now, in the Bible, the glory means often means bright, shining light that we see when God is present. But it also means perfection. It also means excellence. And when the Lord Jesus veiled the glory that was within him, as seen on the Mount of Transfiguration, as Jesus veils that glory, we see in him God's glory, first in moral ways. The radiance of a perfect character, the one who never sinned, the one who never felt short, the one who never had a flaw or a blemish in him, perfect in every word he spoke, perfect in every thought he thought, perfect in everything he saw and did, became the virtue of an exquisite life. Secondly, we're told that this beauty lies in the fact that he was full of grace and truth. That deserves a sermon all by itself. 
But let me just explain it again. Simply, grace, this undeserved kindness that God gives to us, without us doing anything for it, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That grace, completed in truth, absolute truth, so that Jesus was able to say about himself that he is the truth. Then, one more word that came up was law, and that's why I read the law this morning. The law came through Moses, we're told. The law came through Moses. How we live before God, this is how we are to live as a covenant people, Moses said. But a new covenant comes through Jesus Christ to us. And this new covenant is filled with God's grace and God's truth from Jesus. And so there's no other way. People are walking this path of life. I said to Linda this yesterday, I don't think I've ever had a week where I went to the hospital so many times, sat with three people and talk about their death. I can only assume that what they tell me is true. But I've never had the, cha the challenge or the obligation or maybe the joy of t reminding people of the way to, to God. That Jesus is the only way. I had some people tell me this week that they didn't need it that way. They could do it by themselves. They've got it all figured out. They're okay. And I know what they believe is a falsehood and untruth. So let's make some practical lessons out of this, shall we? I'm going to read to you something that I found interesting um, Stephen Cole in, wrote the article, but Stephen Cole um, takes his words from J.C. Ryle, who is an exp expositor on the scriptures. And he says that J.C. Ryle draws several practical lessons from John 1.14, and these are it. He points out that the constant undivided union of two perfect natures in Christ's person give infinite value to for, to his med mediation for sinners, to his imputed righteousness to believers, to his atoning blood, and to his resurrection. And then he adds, did the word become flesh? Then he is the one who can be touched with the feeling of his people's infirmities, because he has suffered himself, being tempted, because he is God, and yet he can sympathize with us because he is man. Did the word become flesh? Then he can supply us with a perfect pattern and example for daily life. Having dwelt among us as a man, we know that the true standard of holiness is to walk even as he walked in John, 1 John 2, 6. He is a perfect pattern because he is God. He is also a pattern exactly suited to our needs because he is man. Finally, did the word become flesh? Then let us see in our mortal bodies a real, true dignity and not defile them by sin. Vile and weak as our bodies may seem, it is a body in which the eternal Son of God was not ashamed to take upon himself and to take up to heaven. That simple fact is a pledge that he will raise our bodies on the last day and glorify them together with his own. End of quote. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So two questions. The first question is, what scripture do I need to place deep within my heart to remember that Jesus and Jesus alone is both God and Savior? Often Christians write him off as one or the other. People in the world may give him less than that, but he is both God and Savior. Second question, what am I doing to make Jesus the center of my life? 
and allowing him to have a dwelling place within me. Let's think about those. There's not a friend like the Lord.